And there have been some innovative trials that have recently been concluded leading to FDA approval of uh, these dramatic agents. Uh, there's the Apollo trial uh, sponsored by Al Nylum uh, featuring patisseran, and then uh, the Inotericin Neuro TTRX trial, uh, which is sponsored by Ionis and Axia Therapeutics. Uh, Jim, can you give us a, a little bit of overview on the design of the Apollo study? Sure. So the Apollo study, the Patisseran study, uh, their main endpoint was the, neurop the modified neuropathy impairment score plus seven, which is essentially a neurologic examination and then some nerve conduction abnormalities, the amplitudes of motor and sensory responses. Uh, and they also had a quantitative sensory uh, study compo uh, component built in, which is somatic uh, smart QST. And these are all different ways of looking at motor deficits, sensory deficits, and uh, some autonomic deficits, although the autonomic was a little um, uh, lacking. Uh, the, uh, then there were many secondary endpoints, and uh, the study showed using uh, patisseran given intravenously every three weeks that there was a very robust change in the modified neuropathy impairment score plus seven uh, in the patisseran versus placebo, and in many patients there was actually improvement in that score. So there was a big difference um, in the uh, change over time in this neuropathy uh, composite scoring system. There was. Uh, it, but what does that mean clinically? Was that meaningful? Yeah, no, I, I think a lot of people find this modified neuropathy impairment score plus seven to be very confusing. Essentially what that is, it's, it's the neurologic exam. So it's patient's weakness, sensory changes, reflex changes, and nerve conduction studies. So that has real meaning to people's lives. If you develop weakness, you can't walk, you can't use your hands, you can't dress. Uh, if you develop numbness, you can't feel the floor, you may become ataxic. If you have a lot of autonomic involvement, you have um, you know, uh, GI dysmotility, diarrhea, lightheadedness. So this large magnitude change in the score has huge clinical uh, implications and big differences in people's quality of lives. And for those people who have a hard time understanding or um, implementing uh, evaluations with the modified NIS plus seven, um, would drug effect be demonstrated by just using the neurologic impairment score, which is the neurologist's direct assessment? Yeah, I think the thing that was really impressive in these studies is that the different components by themselves showed effect. So this was a home run, as I've said. This was a real big difference. So yes, the neurologic examination by itself without all of the other fancy bells and whistles shows an absolute effect. And can a neurologist feel comfortable uh, using their examination in a um, strict fashion uh, that is reproducible? Yeah, no, I think a neurologist can use whatever scale he or she uses and just follow along and show that the neuropathy is not getting worse as long as they are a thoughtful, compulsive neurologist who scores things and uh, pays attention. I think you absolutely, uh, th this isn't really overly fancy. A good neurologic exam is a very powerful tool. Michael, the Ina Tersen study, um, can you give us a little bit of overview on the design of that study? Did it have the same endpoints and your perspective on the composite scoring system versus the trimmed down NIS alone? So the Inotericin study was a little bit shorter, 15 months versus 18 months. Uh, it also was randomized two to one. So two patients were on drug for every one uh, placebo. And at 15 months, there was a highly significant uh, difference between treatment and placebo in the MNIST plus seven score, as well as a co-primary quality of life score, 
which took into account different physical uh, domains, uh, you know, physical functioning, motor strength, uh, pain, things like that. Uh, uh, and so, so uh, highly significant uh, across both measures. And is, uh, is, is, in your opinion, a neurologist evaluation effectively the neurologic impairment score sufficient without the bells and whistles to detect change over time in neuropathy? Uh, yes, yeah, so in this disease, that was shown to be true. So as Jim said, if you stripped away different components of the MNIST plus seven, just the this part of just the nerve conduction or different components of the NIST, they were all significant. So, uh, so I do think a, a good compulsive community neurologist can do an exam that's meaningful and track this disease. Okay, and again, the thing that seems most to distinguish um, these agents from the oral TTR protein stabilizers, these agents more reliably stop disease and there's a signal of some sensory improvement in both trials. Yep. One other thing I just want to add to this discussion is part of the reason we can show this big difference is that HATTR amyloidosis, familial amyloid polyneuropathy, is such a devastating disease that once it starts, it progresses rapidly. So in diabetic polyneuropathy, we've been unable to show effective different agents. And I don't know if it's because they don't work or because the neuropathy progresses so slowly. In familial amyloid polyneuropathy, the neuropathy progresses very rapidly and very severely. And so because of the extent of that disease, we were, we were able to show this big difference within 15 months or in 18 months.